Okay, welcome again. This is the NextGen upgrade for the 6.2021.1 webinar. Our presentation will begin in just a second. Um, everybody is in listen only mode. Feel free to send any questions or inquiries in the questions box at the side. We do have a lot of ground to cover today, so we will get to questions at the end if we have time. If not, we will make sure that we follow up with the right uh, representative after. Um, everybody will receive a link to the recording of the webinar with the slides, so you will get that afterwards. So again, welcome. Let me give you a little bit of a background on eMedApps. eMedApps is a healthcare information technology services company. We're providing practices, clinics, and hospitals with a full range of services as well as a suite of products that are designed to increase efficiency and facilitate communication. We were founded in 1999. We work as a partner with NextGen since about 2001, and we work as a subcontractor for NextGen. We serve healthcare clients all across the USA and services and products for NextGen clients. And let me pass it to Shauna and she'll begin. Welcome everyone. My name is Shauna Wilburn and I'm gonna take you through the EHR portion of the upgrade today. Thank you for joining and we really appreciate all of you being here. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll dive right into the enhancements. I, I do wanna warn you ahead of time, we're gonna move very quick through these. We, as Holly mentioned, we have a lot of ground to cover. So we're gonna move through these uh, various slides pretty quickly. I will not be reading the slides to you, but as Holly mentioned, uh, this presentation will be distributed after the session today so that you can read the details and have these readily available um, when you would like to review them and start preparing for your upgrade. The first enhancement we're going to start reviewing with today is the AUC enhancements. Uh, the past few versions from NextGen have built on this logic and this functionality within the application, and it continues here in the new version with being able to include the HixFix codes as well as the modifiers and automatically charge capture for those items from within your template. So you can do the charge capture. We've got a couple screens here where you can see the codes and the billing. Uh, being available within the templates and then on the left hand side what you might see within the procedures module. E&M coding on the finalized template has also been updated. NextGen added the ability to charge capture for the prolonged services codes. The 99417 and the G2212 can now be uh, charge captured for every 15 minute increment that you go beyond the maximum amount of time. So you do have the ability to charge capture those two codes as well as the units. So if you needed to, to charge two units of those for a 30 minute overage or something like that, you would have the functionality to do that. Dynamic navigation on the assessment plan template. NextGen gave us some configuration options for this template that we haven't had in the past, which is a really nice enhancement to the system to be able to tailor the content to specifically what your practice needs. You can edit information here, rename the tabs, change the order, do some pretty nice things there to really tailor this to your specific clinic's workflow. You also have the ability now to uh, validate the codes that are being captured for family history. You can update the positive and negative codes as you might need to. Uh, if this is not a familiar topic to you, as a lot of times with upgrades, there's various features that it's like, you know, how would that affect me? We've included the link there to the success community where you could uh, go in and get a little bit of additional detail as to why this um, enhancement was put into the system and made available so that you could understand a little bit more about the details and background on this one if that's needed. NextGen added the functionality for the co-managing provider. You can see there in the top toolbar, you have the opportunity to add that into your patient information toolbar if you would like to do that, as well as a new template to where you can capture the co-managing provider within the NextGen chart by specialty. So you have options to capture it in the chart as well as show it on the patient information toolbar, as well as add it into the header of your documents if you would like to. So um, quite a bit of functionality added for this one, which will be a, a nice enhancement um, if this is something that your organization might have been needing. Health promotion plan, you kind of see on the screen here that you have a couple of different options for this new uh, functionality. On the left, uh, you can now document your health promotion plan without a diagnosis. So the example on the left shows you how you can do that without a diagnosis. And then on the right hand side is the traditional template that we've had for some time now where you can capture that information with a diagnosis code. 
And then an additional new feature at the bottom of the template is going to be the patient education button to allow you to access patient education from right within the HPP template. An immunization link was added into your uh, medical surgical interim uh, history panel just to allow you quick access into the immunization history if you would if you have a need to access that kind of on the fly. The prepare template and functionality or kind of the whole prepare process got some updates in this new version. Uh, you can if you're familiar with the prepare template, you immediately can see the kind of the improvements and just the overall design of the template. The, the information is kind of organized in a cleaner, uh, easier to read way on the template. Nixon also added some really neat functionality where if you go to calculate the code and some of the data elements haven't been answered or are missing information, you'll, they'll turn red as you're seeing here on the screen so that you get that reminder that that information needs to be populated. Um, that's just a couple of the highlights. There's quite a few enhancements on the prepare template. But you'll also get um, five new crystal reports that you'll have, have the ability to take advantage of if you'd like to as well with the prepare new functionality. Bright Futures Patient Education. If you uh, happen to upgrade to the 5.9.2020 version, the version from last year, um, you probably saw a new feature to where you could pull in your own patient education and Bright Futures NextGen provides it to you, but you have to import it into the system yourself to make it available within your uh, file patient education window. So now NextGen's made that available to us in English and Spanish both. So just continuing to build on that enhancement from last year and adding more functionality in the new version. We do have a new ABN report that's available within the NextGen application. This was updated per CMS guidelines. Uh, there is no change to the workflow setup or configuration of the ABN. It's simply just a report change. So the new report would pop up versus the old report popping up and you can kind of see some of the things that that uh, CMS changed on the form itself. We now have the ability for drug and allergy interaction checks to take place on the ACE templates anywhere medications are ordered. So you can kind of see on the right hand side a little bit of an example like within the procedure uh, documentation where you can get those drug and allergy inter interaction checks. So really nice new functionality to bring that not only from the modules, but more into the template side of the documentation. Just a field label change here. NextGen changed uh, the word of the field from nickname to preferred name. Uh, all your data will still remain there. Uh, it will still be available to you. And just instead of it saying uh, nickname, it'll now say preferred name. Patient information bar, um, NextGen's done a few updates to the patient information bar. One that you see here is if you hover over the patient's gender, it's going to pop up and give you quite a few fields, sex, current gender, sexual orientation, so on and so forth. So you can see that information and it'd be readily available on the EHR side of things. The PM, you know, it's right across the top of your screen, so it's pretty easily accessible, but in the EHR, um, you had to kind of look for that information and NextGen's made it a little bit more convenient for you here. If you're not a big fan of this option, you can um, opt out of this feature by marking those fields as protected content if you would like to so that they don't display, but that does kind of limit the availability of the fields in, in many different ways. So definitely check that out and evaluate it if, if that's something that um, you might want to look into a little bit more. Also, you see on the patient name here, you can hover over the patient name in your patient information bar and the preferred name will show as well. You can kind of see Charles Darwin as Chuck here in this example. Uh, the preferred name just being, you know, what the patient probably prefers to be called. So making that a little bit more convenient for your end users. And then also the weight will display in the patient information bar now. So in the top example, the weight has been populated at 222 pounds in the vitals, so that'll display. And then in the bottom example, the weight was not populated for that visit. Maybe it wasn't needed for the type of visit, so it just says unknown. Care guidelines. This is probably one of my favorite parts of the presentation because I love care guidelines. Uh, if you've ever worked with me, I'm a super huge care guideline advocate. Um, I've done presentations on care guidelines. Uh, I think they're a great 
part of the next gen application. I think there's a lot of clients out there that maybe tried to use them early on and didn't like the functionality, but next gen's put a lot of effort and a lot of development resources into care guidelines and they are a really fantastic tool. So just a little plug, if you're not using your care guidelines, I really encourage you to maybe take another look at those uh, because I think there's some really great functionality there that, that can benefit every practice. But to get on to the updates, I'll get off my soapbox, <laughs> to get on to the updates, um, the care guidelines updates been merged into the core upgrade package. So in years past, even up till last year, when you got your, you know, your kind of air quotes next gen update, it was always an application update and a KBM update or an ACE update now. Well, care guidelines was always another update sitting out there separate that had to be ran individually. Now it's all been merged into the upgrade package. The reason I spend a, a moment talking about such a geeky part of the upgrade process is it's important for you all to know from the application standpoint that you have to take the care guidelines updates now. It's not separate anymore. So even though it was recommended before, it wasn't required. And so now it's actually a part of the ACE upgrade. So when you get your upgrade applied and test, you're going to get a care guidelines update with it at all with it as well. So if you happen to not be on Care Guidelines 2.0, you're going to get the Care Guidelines 2.0 upgrade with this new version. And then also um, you're going to get any, any patches or any you know, updates that you might have not applied from your last upgrade to now. So that's going to get you current. So just want you to be aware of that, that your Care Guidelines will automatically be touched with this upgrade because I wouldn't want there to be any surprises in that area. We got a couple of really great new functionalities with the care guidelines coming with this upgrade. The ability to satisfy a care guideline based on a scan document has now been added into the system. This is something we've needed for such a long time and NextGen's done a fantastic job adding that in for us and making that available in this new version. So you can see the configuration image there. Basically, when a document scanned in, if you've got all the configuration set up properly, it'll update that care guideline and push out the due date to whatever interval is set for that item. So a really, really nice enhancement on the care guidelines front. And then here's the second big enhancement. There's several enhancements to care guideline, but these are the two big ones um, as far as new functionality. And this one is uh, template data to satisfy care guidelines. We have never had the ability to pick template fields to satisfy care guidelines. Uh, NextGen gave us some logic for like diabetic foot exam and maybe a couple of others that they provided to us, but we've never had the ability as an end user to go in and set that up and configure it as we wanted to. It had to be a code type situation, whether it be like a procedure code or a screening tools description or uh, a test code or something like that. Now NextGen's given us the uh, ability to satisfy care guidelines based on template fields and documentation. So very exciting new features there. And in addition to kind of the new features for satisfying care guidelines, we've got a few other updates in that same vein. Uh, on the actual page display, NextGen has added a lab value indicator. So you can see the little yellow circle there for that particular item, which is a lipid panel. And if you hover over it, it's going to tell you that that one has an abnormal abnormal flag value um, from like what you would see in the orders module, like a high or a high high or a low or a low low. Um, you would see that same indication here. And then the 12, of course, is um, the value of the the value of the test itself. You also have the ability now in care guidelines to configure a seasonal interval. Um, so the seasonal interval will uh, allow you to only make a care guideline due within like maybe a certain few months of the year rather than, you know, like it's showing a flu shot due in July when you probably wouldn't give that. So this is a nice addition as well to really tailor the care guidelines to specifically what the patient might need at that particular time when they're being seen. And then the final two new care guidelines items are hep C screening and unhealthy drug use screening. So these will come out of the box when you upgrade your, your test or your demo or your develop to the new version, you'll see these items present. So quite a few new items were added to care guidelines, but by far the biggest is this new care guideline itself. It's been a long time since we got an actual whole new care guideline item or topic added to the system. And um, this is a really great one. NextGen's added CHC, FQHC, or UDS, I guess depending on you know what you might need it for or how you might use it in your practice. But this is an actual care guideline like health maintenance, diabetes, peds, 
um, this is an actual care guideline that you can apply to patients and you can kind of see in the bullets on the left all the different things that are included out of the box with this guideline. Of course, it's your choice if you choose to use it or if you might want to tailor this or configure it more to be specific to, to more your needs, you're more than welcome to do that. NextGen gives us a lot of opportunities with that with care guidelines, but NextGen will provide this one out of the box. So quite a few new care guideline options um, to be able to take advantage of with this new update. So in the 5.9.2020 version, the, one, the version from last year, we got a new tool which I believe it was called CPOE. It's the blue bar that sits right below your patient information toolbar where you could order information, kind of, you could order tests um, kind of on the fly as you were going through your visit documentation because it sat right above your templates. So at any point during your workflow, you could pop up there, search for a test, place an order, maybe come back later, finish it up. It was really great functionality that NextGen included, brand new technology that we had never had before. And what they what NextGen has done in this version is they've rebranded it to the term order entry. So we're not calling that CPOE anymore. We're calling it order entry now. And they added um, they added and basically linked up all the things that did not make the spring 2020 release. So a big one is immunizations. And you can read all the details here. But one of the big um, things that were added in was the immunization items. It really wasn't complete in the last version. It was usable, but it wasn't, wasn't all the functionality NextGen wanted to have to offer. And now they've completed that for us. And it's really great to make that order entry toolbar more of that comprehensive tool that they set out for that to be. The medication module structured in soda, codified SIGs are now going to be in place within the application. I put this uh, slide in here just so you're aware and you know this is happening behind the scenes, but there are real no real changes to the end user interface. It looks very similar, but this is one of those things that needed to be uh, put into the system for regulatory requirements. And you're going to see as we get deeper into the EHR side of the pre presentation, there are a lot of new features for the 21st Century Cures Act, CCDAs, and FIRE in particular. The medication history has also been updated. Um, in the 5.9.2020 version, the version last year, NextGen started you know, making some great improvements on medication history, and I really believe this is just a continuation of those efforts, um, enhancing that area of the application to be more user-friendly and more comprehensive for the providers. Electronic prior authorizations will now allow you to upload and download supporting documents. So either one or two versions ago, we got this new functionality for to be able to submit electronic prior authorizations through the medication module, you know, back to the payer. And uh, if the payer were to come back and request documentation, in the past, we had no way to get that documentation back to the payer. And what NextGen's done is really bridge the gap in that area. And if the payer comes to you or if the PBM comes to you and requests additional documentation, you will now, through the NextGen application, be able to upload that and submit it back to them. It can only be done upon request, but the functionality is there now, so that can be completely handled right within the NextGen application. Continuing on the medication module updates, you now have a new checkbox prohibit renewal request, which basically indicates to the pharmacy not to send renewal requests for this particular medication. Um, it's, it's not going to prevent the pharmacy from sending it or stop them. It's almost like you sending a note to the pharmacy to tell them that this is what you prefer on this one. Like, don't buy, don't try to send this because, it, you know, it's we're going to have to do some additional. Uh, we're going to have to see the patient or something. It wouldn't be renewed. There's some changes that were made to cancel RX and probably the the most visual change you can see here in the little drop down within the med module. You now have cancel RX, mark ineffective and stop within the medication module. These were some additional um, additional messages that were needed um, when we cancel a message so that the system would know whether a message needs to be sent back to the pharmacy or not. So some additional logic was added here. I'll let you read the details, but NextGen does a good job within the application of guiding the user. You can see 
in the example there, Cancel Rx is the only one that's available for the selected medication. If you were to pick a different medication, you might have different options for this particular function. So NextGen does a really good job of leading you down the path of what your options are for that particular medication. And I've got some examples there and some information about how those fields work. Denied new to follow workflow. NextGen has changed up the denied new to follow workflow a little bit in the new version so that when you um, get a refill into the system and you choose denied new to follow, it's gonna kind of take you through a series of steps. Basically the end result or the end goal is to be able to select the medication that is following. So basically when you deny a medication and say new to follow, that you can kind of link those two together. Um, so you can kind of see an example of the workflow on the top right hand side. Uh, but basically it's gonna send a task and take you through a workflow so that that information can be properly documented. 21st Century Cures Act, first time you're seeing it on your slides, but more of that to come, uh, has a requirement that NextGen had to be capable of including a reason for the prescription. And of course, a reason for the prescription would be the diagnosis code. So you're gonna see a few changes related to the diagnosis code being available and being able to edit that information when it comes to your prescriptions. PDMP updates, you can see here that NextGen's edited the dropdown a little bit that you have within the application. We've always had the PDMP that connects out to APRIS, but they've added the additional option of PDMP viewed via the state portal. So that if your uh, maybe your state is not served by APRIS or possibly you just like your state's uh, portal and you're used to it and your providers are using it, you could capture that documentation and indicate that you did review that um, within the patient's chart. So now I'm gonna take you through several module updates. And these, there's a lot of information on these slides, but I'm just gonna hit the highlights for you. All of this information was needed for the 21st Century Cures Act, CCDA or FIRE. Um, there are some new fields, so that's why I wanna highlight from an end user perspective, there will be a little bit of new fields, but I don't think any of this, while they are technically a day one impact, I don't think any of this is really going to be intrusive into your workflow. And, and quite frankly, probably most of your users wouldn't even notice this because we're not in the modules enough to notice. I had to bring it up and really look for it, to be honest, um, because they're really nicely laid out, they're not intrusive, and you can still do your work um, very easily with the changes that have been incorporated here. So you can see there's a new field for verification status which was required and a few other things were changed here but that's basically the the new field is the big big change as well as a few changes um, in in the drop downs as far as the values that you have to choose from. Problem module, kind of, kind of the same kind of comments I would make. Uh, verification status is the new, new field that you have available. And then you have new options within the, cl within the clinical status dropdown. So um, a few changes there. Again, you know, changes that had to be made for compliance purposes, as well as the similar situation in the procedure module. The thing that's a little bit different with the procedure module that you didn't see on the other two slides is I'm just going to mention this because I know there are probably people on the call that are very into CCDA, FIRE, and all the interoperability things that are happening. So I'm just going to mention this. So if you're more of an end user and not into the, the geeky components, just to tune me out for the next 10 seconds. But um, in this module, in the procedure module in particular, the requirements for CDA and the requirements for FIRE didn't quite align. They were, they were not, uh, comp not, it's not that they're not compatible, but they didn't match exactly. So we couldn't use the same values. So what I included for you here on this slide is a mapping. So you can see the, um, the mapping on the, the export for FIRE and CCDA and how that would be imported back into the system for each of the, the two different technologies. So you can get an idea of the mapping and how NextGen chose to bridge that gap of the requirements not being exactly the same in that particular area. Implantable device, you know, I hate to say it, rinse and repeat requirements for 21st Century Cures Act, some, some changes uh, made to this area to be able to capture and exchange information that we did not have before, like MRI safety status, latex safety status, and so on and so forth. 
We do have a new module in clinical reconciliation, lab results. Uh, NextGen has done a fantastic job over the last few years of continuing to expand the clinical reconciliation area of the application. And there is just a lot of great information that you can pull in electronically from these tools where we can exchange this data and lab results is the newest one. We have a couple of new updates in the new version related to auto and virtual visits. So you now will have the way you can kind of see here, file, new, schedule, on-demand, next-gen visit. So you'll have a way now to schedule an on-demand, next-gen virtual visit so that you can um, engage with the patient and do a visit more on the fly without it necessarily having to be scheduled. And then within the application itself, You've got a new icon listed here. It looks like a little camera in your patient information toolbar. So if you're using auto, what will happen is once a patient's been checked in, this button will become available and you can click on it and join the session with the patient right from within your EHR. Then you can also end it as well from that same button. And then the final uh, new feature that we have on the virtual visit side of things is on the finalized template. Uh, if you have a, one of the two new visit types that were added to the system, virtual visit telephone or virtual visit video, these are two new specialty, I'm sorry, two new visit types that were added for all the specialties within the application. If you use one of these two specialties, the finalized template is going to have an additional panel available to you, the virtual visit billing, to where you can complete the needed billing components for that virtual visit. If you don't want, use one of these two visit types, this panel will be grayed out and not available to select. Title 10 and FPAR 2.0, uh, you can see the new updates outlined down the left-hand side, basically just keeping these existing tools compliant and current on the regulations. We have a new APSO document. So basically, uh, we have a simplified document that providers can generate, review, and you can even save this to um, the encounter if you would like to. So you have some new functionality with that. This is a, a user preference, so you can choose to turn this on and enable it uh, just like you can, you know, the, the quick view and some of the other things that we have available. A few new SOGI document changes. In the 5.9.2020 version, we had quite a few uh, SOGI document changes, and now NextGen's added a few more in the new version. Uh, you can see here on the practice configuration template the options that you have to include on the master documents, the patient plan, or included on both. Whatever you pick and choose would be in, in, added to the header of the document selected. So that's a little bit about the new features of the NextGen EHR, the application itself. Let's talk a little bit about the ACE now, the templates, the adaptive content engine. We've got some new um, exciting new features here with the templates. Uh, the first one is on the screening tools log, you can now add in billing components. We've never been able to do this before and this is such a nice enhancement to where now you can set up and configure billing so that as you do those screening tools, if there's a particular add-on cost or a charge that you can add on to that visit to compensate you for the time and effort to perform that screening tool, you can now configure that and set it up within your practice and have that available to your end users. No, no customization or anything required. This would be, you know, configuration that you can do within the application that will upgrade with you um, for the years to come. And then you also have the ability to uh, build a custom screening tool yourself. So NextGen has provided you a tool to where you can build that screening tool and incorporate that into the application if you would like to as well. The OEM template, this is a template that we've had within the NextGen application for many years. Um, it just had, it needed some touch-ups. There's some, there's no design changes. If you use this template, you probably are noticing it doesn't really look any different than it has over the years. But lots of great uh, under the hood enhancements, bug fixes, and even some document improvements to go along with um, this documentation and this template. A breast self-awareness checkbox was added to the breast physical exam template. So if you've had a need for that, you now have availability to access that. And probably the biggest change that you were waiting on me to talk about is the intake template. 
So as you know, in 5.9 2020, NextGen rolled out their new um, template stack and gave us a redesigned SOAP template. Well, now in 6.2021, this year's upgrade, they continued to move down that path and gave us an intake and a well child SOAP. So now we have three templates, the SOAP, the intake and the well child soap that are all on the enhanced template platform um, that are all in the new version. So that has been incorporated into this version. If you install it and test your soap template, I'm sorry, your intake template or your well child soap will be in the new format and have the new look and feel. But in addition to just adding in two new templates, the intake and the well child soap, NextGen has made quite a few enhancements to the enhanced template set um, for all three, the soap, the intake, and the well child soap. And some of the things that we were hoping to see are definitely in this version. So I'm very excited about the new features that we have here. Um, just to highlight a few for you, you can pick and choose your cards now, which was something we really wanted and did not see in the, the 5.9 uh, 2020 version, but we've got it in the new version. You can uh, move your cards around. You can have up to three buttons or three check boxes on any of the cards, um, whereas in the last version that was limited to certain ones. So lots of great new features and enhancements on all three of the enhanced templates that are really going to make uh, these templates configurable and really tailored to each individual user's needs. So there are some new features, a couple of things for ophthalmology. There is uh, one item for cardiology. I'm going to kind of cruise through those just for the sake of time today. They will be in the presentation. So if those are your specialties, you can definitely take a peek at that. USCDI, another acronym, another entity, another, another regulatory set of requirements, but you can see there's some patient demographic enhancements here um, related to that, as well as some CCDA R2.1 updates that I've got outlined here for you. Um, I wanted to kind of get down to some of the things that are probably a little bit more um, involved in the day to day for the patients, which I'm sorry, for the users, which would be, you know, like your care plan, uh, clinical status and status are now required fields. So a few a few changes that we had to make or next gen had to make there, as well as on the vital signs, adding the weight for length for um, certain age groups. Um, next gen also had to give uh, the ability to have multiple care teams. And so NextGen offers two sets of care teams for the patients. You can have a practice care team and a patient care team. So a little bit of information, how you would go about configuring each of those. And then NextGen's also added the ability in this new version to export your an individual patient's electronic health information or EHI. So from the file person extract menu in a uh, file maintenance, you can export out a single medical record for a patient if you had a need to do. And of course, this goes back to information blocking and patients making requests to your clinics for that information. And this new version will have the functionality to support that. So again, a little bit on the geeky side here, allergy API updates. This is the actual update that kind of ties back to the changes in the allergy module. This is a little example of um, the update that goes on to the API side as well as the problem. So didn't want to leave that out for anyone that might be interested, but it is a little on the technical side on those items. Population Management Hub, you now have the opportunity to customize your care opportunities display by user. So that's a fantastic uh, user option to be able to set that screen up and make it uh, most usable for each individual person, depending on their role and what they might be using the hub for. And then here as well, you got a new feature to be able to see the next scheduled appointment, which will bring a lot of value if you're doing any types of follow-ups, recalls, things like that. And last but not least, a new encounter variable in template editor. If that's something that you do, get in a template editor, make a few changes to the template, you've got a new option there. So be sure and uh, check that out. So I do, before I pass it to my colleague, Betsy, I do wanna just let you know that those are the highlights of the EHR um, new release. Please know we tried to capture most of the highlights that we're gonna you know, affect most clinics. There are probably things that were not in this presentation. We highly recommend that you go to the NextGen website, review the release notes, 
look at the documentation, the recordings that NextGen has out there. They have a great landing page for the upgrade. So don't hesitate to hop out there and get into the specifics. But hopefully this presentation will give you a nice overview of what the new features of the EHR portion of the version has to offer. So with that, Betsy, I'll pass it over to you to run through the PM new features. Excellent. Thank you. And let me just go ahead and share my screen. Um, okay. All right. So I am Betsy Anderson. I am a senior application specialist here with EMED Apps, and I'll be covering the practice management uh, enhancement highlights. So, so the first thing is that um, NextGen has added the security level of not being able to add zip codes on the fly. There are many practices that use zip codes for reporting. And so um, now moving forward, if you do not have the rights to add a zip code in file maintenance, you will not have the rights to add it within the practice management system um, throughout. Allow override of credit card transactions. So some of the larger organizations were looking for a means for reporting to be able to track Visa copay versus Visa uh, deposit, et cetera. So uh, we now have the ability, if you do have your credit card integrated into NextGen, that we can set up additional um, credit card transaction descriptions. So that way, at the time of payment posting, that we can select the appropriate item uh, enabling this will disable the default patient cash and account cash. So there, uh, NextGen has uh, removed the angel icon that we would generally see on a deceased patient. So now um, the visual indicator that we'll have is the label of patient expired under the patient picture, as well as an alert with a caution sign indicating the date the patient was deceased. So prior to this version, we did not have an option to not carry forward insurances when we created a new encounter. And some felt that that was causing additional work because we would have to then remove the insurance um, if it was no longer appropriate. So you can set a practice preference that will default all new encounters as self-pay. I do want to caution that um, this could increase the self-pay encounters, but there are a couple things that we're going to go over that could help um, be a safety net. So first of all, here is where you would set that up in your practice preferences. Um, out of the box, this will be checked. So your functionality will be the same as today unless you go in and uncheck this. I also want to point out in a couple of slides, I'm going to cover the when copying from last encounter right above that red box that I have there, um, that still works independently of, that, of the checkbox to carry forward payers. Um, in our auto flow, this option is available to you today, and you could use this hand in hand um, or independently of carrying forward the insurance. But if you enable this, then the system will not allow the end user to move forward until they have confirmed the insurance. So this image indicates where I have opted to not carry forward insurance, so therefore it's self-pay, and I've also enabled that insurance must be confirmed, so I cannot proceed in my auto flow until I change that to yes. As I mentioned, the last encounter, this again works independently from carry forward insurance. Um, so if you have those enabled, you will still be able to click that last encounter uh, button from the insurance screen or in the encounter screen. NextGen has done uh, some work to clean up our view of our payers. Uh, we know that sometimes patients uh, change insurances quite often and we hide them and it just kind of clutters up uh, the, the view here. So they've changed the, the label here from available insurance to insurance listing. And if you should so choose to, you can check to show the hidden uh, that will then present anything that's hidden behind the scenes. Um, and that has been um, updated throughout several areas. So from our patient banner, if you click the insurance button up there, we'll see that we can show hidden as well as in our appointment. Uh, the system will not allow you to promote uh, hidden insurance above an active insurance. So really done some nice work to clean up the view for us. 
And it's the same for our insurance uh, employer insurance maintenance screen. And as I referenced, got ahead of myself there. Um, so um, it, you cannot promote it higher uh, than an active insurance. And additionally, if we have hidden a payer in file maintenance, the end user can no longer unhide that within the patient's chart. They can try, but they'll get a message that says that it's hidden in file maintenance, and so we cannot perform that action. Default encounter timestamp. So currently, if you create an encounter from the chart or charge entry or group encounters outside of the appointment, we know that it defaults to 12 a.m. Well, if you choose to turn this on in practice preferences, then if you default encounter billable time to the system timestamp, it will um, mirror the same time as your system in your billable timestamp in your encounter. Estimate patient cost. So this is pre-installed and comes free to all clients. Um, and what this will do is it's a tool that can use the contract allowable field, your encounter practice copay field, your transaction history, um, as well as if you use RTS, um, your eligibility returned information to provide you with an estimate patient portion. So this is what that screen will look like. Um, you see that it's pulled in our CPT codes. Um, again, using the logic that I mentioned on the previous slide, if we try and calculate uh, when we click submit, it will return for us um, what the patient um, portion should be. And in my example, I, I didn't have any data that returned, so it said unable to find. But you can launch this from several different areas in the appointment book or the encounter, um, in the people lookup, as well as the taskbar. Eligibility, eligibility transactions. So they've changed this label from view last um, eligibility to view latest successful response. So we have the option to set how many days back we want the system to look anywhere from one to 365 in our user preferences. Group scheduling. So NextGen continues to make enhancements to our group scheduling. So now uh, we have additional flexibility. If you have your group scheduling enabled in practice preferences, you'll see a, an additional option under the check-in create encounter to group appointment. Um, that we can select members as they arrive, or we can select all scheduled members. So here's a, an image of where I have only selected two people um, that have arrived, and it will go ahead and add the group encounter. You can assign a patient type at, at this time as well. Additionally, if a group encounter is created outside of the appointment book. So say your clinical staff is the one that initiates that group encounter from the EHR side. We can then put that on our appointment book. The system will search for any existing in, uh, group encounters and we can tie it in. Now we also have the check-in option. Just as if I were an individual patient, you can select um, the check-in and it will go right through your auto flow for um, checking in. And the same is true for checking out. So whatever patient name you have visible on the appointment book, you'll be going through your auto flow sequences for that person. You can do that one at a time. Uh, additionally, we didn't have a check-in or check-out timestamp, but NextGen has addressed that in this version for our group encounters. All right, more behavioral health stuff. So um, some payers require that we combine like CPT codes or HICPIC codes into one claim form um, in order to receive reimbursement, and we have to sum those two up. Well, in order for NextGen to achieve that in BH 3.0 and higher, uh, from the EHR side, um, they will send back a consolidated encounter. Well, currently in our version, we assign our programs at the encounter level, so we were losing visibility of what the program that encounter or what that visit was for. So to address that, they've moved it down to our charge line items um, and made that available for us on several different reports. Again, behavioral health. So if you use the non-coordinated SIM library to define your billing rules, 
uh, the system was a little confused if we had the same CPT um, in multiple scenarios. So now they've applied the logic uh, that it will, if it sees duplicate SIMs, it's going to grab the logic from the SIM and the provider credential in the hierarchy. That will be its first selection. All right, if you use EDI services, um, then NextGen has added in some visibility to see how our recall messages have been sent and when. Um, you can set this job on the BBP as I have an image here, or you can manually run it, uh, the process recall message update. And here is what that will look like. So the image on the left is, of course, I've opened the recall plan and we'll have a new button there for messaging info. And on the right is what it will look like as to when the message was sent and the method and the result. All right, so um, next few slides are going to be talking about uh, claim uh, and EDI claim file updates. So um, maybe this will apply to you and maybe not. Uh, but now for the UB04FL38, we have three different options to populate that, depending on what your payers need. Um, also, for our ADA claims, they're going to sunset the 2006 form, and they will now support the 2019. There are some insurances that um, require that the referring name match our rendering when they're equal to one another. I guess there were payers that were denying some of those. So, Here's an option where we can send, um, replace the middle initial of the referring physician with the full middle name for our claim print. Um, they have addressed this on all of our claim form types, our professional, institutional, and dental. If you are sending institutional, we need to make sure that on our payer practice UB tab that we've um, tied in referring. And again, here are images indicating that we can send our provider's full name, again, on our 837i, T, and our um, ADA. All right, uh, CHD type of bill discharge. So if you were populating that type of discharge, it was only going on our electronic claims. Um, now we can add it to paper claims if we need to. Out of the box, it will be disabled. So this is a setup item if you need to have this populated on your paper form. Process pending charges. They've added two new drop-down or two, filter, two new filter options. So we have financial class and primary payer that are, can be used in addition to any of the other fields that are available there. Uh, one thing to point out though is generally the rule of thumb is our BBP is exactly as if our options are exactly as if we were doing them from the front of the application. Um, however, this one is not yet on the BBP. So uh, no update there just for when you're manually processing your pending charges. And here's a requirement specific for California Medicaid managed care paper claims. So they have a very um, unique uh, manner in which they want the units and uh, basis of measure to be reported. So if you need to meet this requirement, I recommend that you copy your existing library, make your changes, and then tie this only the new library only to the payers who have this requirement. Our claim request report. Again, if you use a claim modifier library and we set up our rules and file maintenance, we know that that only gets added to our claims, not to our charges. So we needed a means to be able to review what was actually going out on our claims. So on our existing um, claim request report, they have added additional fields so that you can review those. Claim status request. So you can, um, if you set, up, set this up, you can um, do a claim status on any archived electronic claims. Of course, we can't do any paper, but it does work for institutional, professional, and dental. Um, continuing on with the claim status, there's a new report design, and there is a brand new claim status report that you'll want to take a look at. Um, it stores the information on our clinical history notes tab. Um, we can submit right from the encounter, 
And this image that I have here is I'm within the patient chart on the general tab. And so right at a snapshot, we'll be able to see what our status is. Alt-payer master file. So for those of you out there who need to use the alt-payer, which is where we have one payer built, but for specific CPT codes, we have to build a different payer. So currently, we only have an option to build one alternate payer. So now NextGen has given us the option that we can attach as many alt payers as we need to be able to create the claims. So this will allow us to have one encounter and it will create all the claims based on the rules that we build within file maintenance um, so that we, we can get our billing out correctly. Also, we can now report on our alt payer. So you will see a brand new option in our master file system. It's called payers, alt payers. If you use alt payers today, those will migrate out of the payers. We'll go on to what the payer looks like in a moment. But any um, alt payers that you have set up will be listed here and you can go in and um, assign your submitter profiles, your claim edits, your transactions, um, so we complete the build here under our payers, alt payers. Then this is what our payer will look like. So on our alt payer tab, you see I now have a window there where I could click the um, open menu button and attach my existing um, alt payers that I just built in the previous screen. Once I'm within that alt payer, that's when I can get down to the level of by location, by CPT, maybe by provider. Um, so you can go ahead and add as many as you need to to achieve your billing needs. Continuing on with our alt payer changes and what that looks like on the PM side, in payment entry uh, for ERA and for manual posting, you will see any and all alt payers that you have built attached to the payer. And the image on the right is I'm in the patient chart on the insurance tab. And I can see that this payer is using an alt payer. Custom claim forms. So there are some payers out there who don't accept the standard claim forms. So you've all had to build your forms or forms enhanced. And uh, prior to this version, if you needed to print those, you depended on somebody going and, and performing that function. Well, now we can build that, we can add it into the BBP to have the automation there for those custom claim forms that you've built. Okay, so the uh, statement exception option. So I know of a few people that learned the hard way that if you had your statement exceptions turned on and you had the job set on the BBP to either print or export, that if there were any exceptions found, the job stopped and your statements didn't proceed. So the only option if you wanted them on the BBP was to turn that off. Well, now we can check for statement exceptions and tell the application, if you find some, that's okay. Let the claim, let the statements go. All right, contract ERA payment discrepancies. So in our remittance profile, I'm just gonna hop down here for a second because I wanna point out that we've always had this default for contract not equal to our payment amount, um, where we could build a dummy code. And if the system um, found that from my contract to what's reported as my allowed amount on my EOB didn't match, it would insert that reason code for me so I could report and then do some extra work on that to contact the payer. Well, now NextGen has added an option to where the contract of the allowed amount is the same, but my payment, and if I add my payment and my patient responsibility, that does not add up to my allowed amount. So um, we can create this new reason code. Um, we can create tasks that will then automatically go out to somebody to review. Uh, it's also included on our reports, and it allows us to define um, what we want the system to calculate to see if it adds up to our allowed amount. Uh, it only applies if it's an ERA payment and the primary payer. So manually posted payments, this won't work for. So back here, so here I've set up a new reason code of pay there. So there's a variance in my payment. 
and I've given it a name that the remit is not equal to the contracted amount. Note that I have added in here that not only do I want it to count my payment, but it also needs to sum up my, my coinsurance, my copay, and my deductible if indicated on the ERA. If those things do not all add up to my contract reimbursed amount, that's when this um, reason code will be inserted. Um, keep in mind that when you build new reason codes, they end up at the very bottom of your reason code priority. So make sure that you hop in there and move that up to the top and at least above your PR code. So that logic uh, takes effect before any of the PR. Uh, you can also choose to set your status to none, which allows you to contact the insurance to try and collect that extra money before you build a patient. Tax rates. So for those of you out there that use the tax rates, uh, I guess there was a need to add county local tax. So in these next few slides, you'll see that you'll the fifth field is available in our tax rate, um, in where we assign our tax percentages, in our tax exemptions. So it's just throughout uh, all of the taxes, you'll see a fifth um, new field. So should you need that, of course, you'll need to populate that. This is very exciting. So this is the first time we have claim edits that look back to EHR. So we have two brand new claim edits that will allow us to create a, um, or stop a claim from generating if a document is missing or the document's there, but it's not signed off on. So of course, all of this starts in our system admin. We have to indicate which documents or reports that we require sign off on. So once you have that set up, when you go in, the new edits are 312 and 313. Um, of course, you would check it to enable it. Then you see my pop-up list there. That's reflective of what I had selected in System Admin. So I can pick the documents that I need to have signed off before I want a claim to go out the door. Additionally, I want to point out that you can create tasks. And um, the system can also auto-generate um, a task if this claim edit is fired. So this one is for require sign-off. And <clears throat> 313, excuse me, is um, that the document is just missing. And again, we can create a task type. So um, now these tasks do not go to EHR, to the provider. However, it will give you good visibility and uh, reporting uh, to, so that you can go and contact your providers and, and have them complete what they need to in EHR so you can do proper billing. And lastly, so um, there's been a need in file maintenance to see what changes have been made, who changed them, what was it, what what was it before, and now they've done that. So they've started with our provider master file. Um, from what I hear, it's, it sounds like that they're going to continue to build on being able to audit changes in file maintenance. But in this version, um, we have that we can see anything that's been changed within the provider master file in our advanced audit. Okay. So I am going to pass it back to Shauna so that she can talk about this last, last exciting piece. Awesome. Thank you, Betsy. So it, do we need to upgrade? That's always the question that I get. I talk to people all the time about upgrades and infrastructure and features and different things. And the question always is, do I, do I really need to deal with this right now? Because the reality is in healthcare, we're always busy. Uh, this year in particular with COVID and having to make adjustments and uh, things are different this year. Do we need to take this upgrade? And the answer is yes, you need to upgrade. It should really be every organization's goal to upgrade once a year. Take the next gen upgrade. If you can't do that, stay with stay within one or two upgrades. There are so many regulatory and compliance type components of these upgrades. You need them to get incentive dollars. You need them to get bug fixes and to really just provide the best end user experience for your staff. 
Now, I would tell you one thing that is very important to consider when you start considering taking this upgrade is your hardware, your infrastructure. NextGen has a technical section of that 6.2021.1 landing page, that homepage I talked about. NextGen has a whole section of technical documentation out there. And you need to evaluate your hardware, your infrastructure, to determine if you're on a version on your hardware, like Windows or SQL, that can accept this new version. Last month, we do these webinars every month. If you're just now um, seeing the notices about them, we do these webinars on different topics pretty much every month. And last month, we did part one of this webinar, which was the technical aspect of the next gen upgrade. And it went through what you need to review, how to review it. That webinar is recorded and posted on our website at emadapps.com. And you can also go to YouTube, go to the top, search emadapps, and you'll see a lot of different presentations and different things we've done. Um, over the past years, but that recording will also be out there. Uh, if you have any questions about what you need to look at on the technical side of things, please go watch that uh, webinar. And I believe it'll help you to set, to lay the foundation of how do I even get started on this upgrade? So when you talk about getting started, what we need to talk about is the timeline. So the timeline is going to be the key to looking at what we um, might want to do as far as upgrading. So the first step is to look and evaluate your hardware. Is your hardware on a version that can accept the 6.2021 upgrade? If it is, then let's start talking about when do I want to upgrade test and when do I want to upgrade production? So the things you want to consider in when I want to upgrade test and when I want to upgrade production are some of these regulatory requirements. Unfortunately, in our business and healthcare, they drive so much of what we do. And one of the big things you have to consider with this particular upgrade is your patient portal because the patient portal needs to be upgraded at the same time as your next gen application. So there's some coordination that has to go into that. So be sure and talk with your next gen account manager, talk internally, call EMAT apps, we'd be happy to help, but start planning now. If you wanna upgrade this year, now is the time to start planning and at least looking at your hardware, your infrastructure and thinking about the patient portal and how this timeline is gonna lay out over the course of the next few months and how we might be able to accomplish whatever date that you might have in mind. So with that, I will pass it over to Holly to wrap up the webinar for us. All right. Well, thank you, guys. I know that we're right on time at this moment, so we really don't have too much to go over. Any additional? Um, you will be receiving a uh, link into the video as well as a copy of the slides. It usually comes out about 24 to 48 hours after today's presentation. Um, also, feel free to reach out to any of your reps if you know those. If you don't, feel free to send an uh, email to info at emadapps.com. We'll route it to the right person for any questions. If you need any assistance with your upgrades. We are here to help and uh, thank you for your time and we hope you guys got some good info here that will benefit you in the near future. Everybody have a great day.